Thank you so much for being here. We're delighted to have Shashi Tharoor here. And um, so I will not do a lot of, you know, so sort of, uh, yeah. uh, because if you put everything Fantastic. Um, so Shashi is here for an hour. He's uh, going through, you know, he's recovering from COVID. He's doing very well, but, you know, his energy is limited. So what I want to say is if you can keep your questions short and the way to do your questions is to just put it in your chat box, chat box, and then so you get to ask if you add it to the chat box, we just, we can see your question and we can call on you and you can ask your own question of Shashi. Yeah. So I'm going to get started and I'm going to ask you a very philosophical question, Shashi. Uh -huh. uh, which is something I've actually thought about, which is it's been a year of a horrific crisis. Uh, it's a global crisis. It's something that all of humanity has shared. And we've seen every part of human behavior. You know, we've seen people spit on other people because they are, they've been asked to you know, wear masks. We've seen people sort of suffer immensely. We've seen people be incredibly generous to each other. Um, I wonder, like, now it's more than a year, like, what have we learned about who we are as human beings? And, you know, and maybe also, like, what you've learned about yourself, because I think it's done a lot of soul searching in on ourselves as well, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think that the, the larger question is perhaps, if you like, what we've learned as societies, and then we can talk about what we've learned as individuals. Um, I was certainly very troubled about some of the trends that became apparent um, very early on in COVID, in the pandemic in 2020 itself. Um, uh, very much um, uh, an increased fear of the other, uh, unfounded rumors and accusations against people when COVID first broke out, blaming others on the basis of their national origin, religious, ethnic, regional identities. Uh, we had the Tablighi Jamaat business when uh, when they were blamed for spreading COVID in the country. Uh, we had actually episodes uh, that haven't been much publicized, but at the time, mm -hmm. citizens from our Northeastern states suffering mm -hmm. racial discrimination because of their supposedly Chinese features when China was being blamed. A lot of that kind of demonization of other people, um, I think re revealed us in a very unattractive light. Similarly, our neglect of the migrant workers, the governments, um, failure to take them into account in its abrupt decision making um, um, and, and the horrendous plight of those people. Mind you, it also brought out the best in our humanity in many ways in which people turned out to help others and, and right along the path, along the highway, there was all kinds of assistance offered uh, from food and drink and water and tea to, um, to uh, uh, footwear, to, to people whose footwear had worn out on the the long journey. So some kind of kindness also came out. Uh, at, the, at the very broad level, I think we've seen, thanks to the pandemic, the rise oh, of... Shashi I'm sorry, you might want to urge others to mute their sounds. I'm getting a lot of other sounds coming in, Lakshmi. But just to say, uh, at the politi political level, the support for national strongmen increased. Many of them use the uh, the, the pandemic to shore up their authority and power. We saw that here. We saw it in countries all over the world. Though, ironically, the more successful leaders were the ones who were actually not the strong men, but the democratic-minded women leaders, which is an interesting uh, sign as well. Um, on the economic front, we saw this huge rush to reset global supply chains, to raise trade barriers, the demand for more protectionism and self-reliance, Mr. Modi calling for Atman Nirbharta here, uh, and, and the suspicion of globalization, that global supply chains are vulnerable to disruption, that therefore unsustainable, depending on foreign countries for essential goods, even the pharmaceuticals or the ingredients that go into making them, all of that uh, could be so um, worrying, could be fatal, that you suddenly need it to be much more self-reliant. All of these things, I think created um, certain kinds of distortions in the way in which 
the world societies and states had run. Now, each of these could, could, could be worthy of a full conversation, but just to give you a, a broad brush answer, I think that we will find that in, in many ways, uh, some of these things will have lasting effects. And um, the rise of the surveillance state, um, uh, thanks to COVID. I mean, I remember in our own country, but in many countries, uh, when people said, oh my gosh, uh, we need to develop apps because our data systems are inadequate to monitor and track the spread of transmission of COVID. So suddenly dedicated apps and tools had to come up in many countries, including the Arogya Setu and ours, to track a person's data, their travel history, their contact with other individuals who might be carrying the virus. And of course, these are all tools that will be very useful for a surveillance state to see who you're meeting, uh, where you're going, what uh, undesirables you're coming into contact with well after the pandemic is over. So all of these things, the question of whether we might have seen in the overwhelming reliance on online technologies, uh, a heck of a lot more data generation that both private companies and intrusive governments could benefit from at the expense of our lives, our privacy, our, 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 our ways of living. Uh, we'll also have a different uh, world in terms of everything from national and international travel, which in many ways has already been dramatically altered, student life, uh, which has been dramatically affected with the uh, two-year extinction of campus life, uh, work from home and work management practices, that could be a separate question. There's so much to be discussed, um, uh, but, but many of those things are changing. Some companies already made work from home uh, a permanent feature, and in places like New York, we're reading about very many um, office buildings running empty as people cancel their, their leases. So all of these are big picture lessons we've learned. On the individual personal kind of lessons um, that uh, I myself or you myself, I think one of the things that we've been forced to learn is how much we need to be in the routine physical presence of other people. How much do we need other people to get through each day? Um, uh, I, I certainly, um, you know, coming from a profession where I'm all the time with people and meeting people, addressing people, doing events with people, um, it was uh, an extraordinary transformation and something that I found, uh, fortunately, I was, I was very comfortable. Can you maintain human contact sufficiently when working remotely, when working from home? Uh, I was relieved to find out how many things I could achieve as a politician for my constituents um, by, by telephone, landline, internet, and so on. So do we really need to be out there? Of course, politics is a peculiar profession because it's not even enough to get things done. You have to be seen and shown to be getting things done. So that lack of visible photo ops can still hurt politicians, but it taught me that in other professions, certainly you can be as effective without being physically present. Um, can you manage well without an externally imposed structure to your days, meetings, demands, traveling to different events, uh, different lunches, dinners, uh, other people's conferences, etc. cetera, when everything is now happening at your computer. Uh, in fact, for me, I remember in 2020 when I didn't have COVID and I was uh, very active, um, I found myself actually busier than when uh, in my, in my pre-pandemic life, because in my pre-pandemic life, at least, you know, if I'd already accepted a speech in Pune on one day, I couldn't accept a speech in Kolkata the same day, so I would turn one down. During last year's uh, raised webinar circuit, that excuse is not available. So I would be doing a, a, a webinar out of Pune and then a half an hour later a webinar out of Calcutta and half an hour later a webinar out of New York, uh, all in one day, which of course would not have been possible before. So it's just some people, I think you had to really adjust to different work patterns. The environment, many of us have had to think about that. I live in Delhi and for me, one of the most astonishing discoveries of, um, of the initial phases of the pandemic was how clean the air could be and how you could actually see the sky and, and the clouds, which you know, I'd simply not been used to uh, for a decade before that, before the pandemic began. Um, how much do you need stimulus? Um, uh, new challenges, new projects, new places, new people. I lived, led a high stimulus life um, for the previous dozen years. There were things happening every day without exception. Um, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. 
Um, and I was very surprised to find that I was content during the pandemic without all of these things. I was no yearning for travel without the old itch to get out um, and to be seen doing things, to be seen trying to make a change. I know that for some people, this has led to a sense of isolation or anxiety or, or feeling hopeless or helpless. Um, but, you know, for many of us, I find that uh, the pandemic and the lockdowns and the, and, and the work from home and everything else have helped us to develop healthier and more regular habits. Um, now, in my case, now I'm suffering from long COVID, so I'm spending a lot of time in bed. But when I was healthy, I was spending a lot more time in the gym than I ever did before. I was, I was uh, also waking up and sleeping at more regular hours than I ever could before. And I was altogether much healthier in 2020 than I had been for some time. Mind you, catching COVID has knocked some of that out, but there you are. And finally, I think, you know, I, I always knew I had a good sense, I had a good capacity to deal with uncertainty, to deal with novelty. Uh, but I found with many friends, they've not found this a welcome development at all. Uh, COVID taught many of us, so we're not in control of very much. We're not in control of our schedules, of our health, uh, of the things we used to take for granted. Uh, our options have suddenly narrowed. Um, we have to find within ourselves the capacity to handle adversity, to cope with uncertainty, uh, and to live within the limitations imposed upon us by this, this awful illness. Uh, so I must say that um, realizing that uh, it's okay, that the fact that you can't control as much as you're used to controlling um, doesn't necessarily need to prevent you from planning and organizing your life uh, as long as you respect the importance of adaptability uh, to the things you can't help uh, and you have to live with. Um, I think you're okay. I mean, I, 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 I worry about those friends who said, well, nothing is controllable, so let's not even try to plan and organize our lives. Nothing can be done. This COVID has got control of us. I would argue that one could actually try and make something more of our, of our lives if we stressed on the capacity for adaptation. That was a very long answer, but I'm sorry, it was a question that couldn't be answered more briefly. No, no, it's a great answer because I actually think what we learned most about ourselves is how we deal with limitations. Yeah. How we deal with boundaries, right? And, and things that are non-negotiable. And that's where you go from people who will spit at someone's face because they're forced to wear a mask, right? To people who have actually thrived in those limitations and done really wonderful things and found new things to do. So I'm going to ask Anish Malpani, who actually has a, has a great question, and maybe the pandemic will sort of help us answer that question. Anish? Anish? Hi, sorry, sorry. My internet's fast for a second. Um, so awesome that you guys are doing this. Um, really quickly, I'll keep it short, as you said. Um, how do you think we, or what can we do um, as a society, as a community, to move from a more traditional money-centered capitalism into a more human-centered, planet-centered capitalism that focuses on maximizing human thriving um, um, in sync with the planet. Is it possible in the next decade? How does India play its role? I guess I'm continuing the, the philosophical question trend from, from Lakshmi. So I'd love your, love your thoughts on that. And your perspective and your opinion, how we can, what could we do differently? Thank you, Anish. Well, as you know, this is not totally uh, a pandemic-related idea. It's been around for a while. For about 20 years, we've been talking about the idea of, um, of, of companies moving away from what you call uh, money-centered capitalism to combining people, profits, and planet, uh, the three P formula. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the guy who came up with it in the 1990s, an American. But it's, 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 it's a very simple idea that a company, uh, any capitalist enterprise, should be concerned as much about the impact of its work on people. Um, of course, the profit, the bottom line is essential for companies to be able to survive and flourish, but also the impact on the planet, the environment. Um, and this is uh, an idea that's gaining more and more acceptance, gaining more and more ground. The United Nations has been promoting this idea through its uh, global compact. Uh, many companies uh, at least claim to be following, um, following this kind of approach. So you asked, is it realistic? I would say, yes, it's very realistic. It takes into account some real needs. Um, are we going to just switch over from a pure obsession with profits to all of these things? No, because of the three Ps for every company, 
the first P of profit will always come first and they'll justify it in terms of their responsibility to their shareholders. But it's also because no one goes into business in a purely philanthropic uh, uh, bent of mind. They go in in order to succeed, to make money, to thrive. And it's from their success that they're willing to take care of other things. So I, I, would, I would argue that you will find a niche that um, there is more progress in this direction. India uh, is a country where I think you can't help but be aware of the impact of what you're doing on people because the, the environment around you reminds you every day that you're living amidst people who are poor, you are dealing with people who need help, you're seeing them in your newspapers and your news and everything else, and you're hearing about them from politicians, from the government. So I'd like to think that India will head more in that P3 direction. But I would agree that we're not there yet, and it's going to be a slow evolutionary process, which will take some years to be the overall norm. But in the, in the one generation that we've been hearing about it, the idea has gained much more acceptance than before. Thank you. So Moitre has a completely radically different question about how you read Shashi. Moitre? Mm -hmm. Uh, hello, sir. Um, well, it comes from this interview that I had watched of yours uh, a few years back, I think. Uh -huh. where, uh, somebody had asked you about your secret to the vocabulary that you possess. And your simple answer was that I read. And yeah. <laughs> that uh, made me always curious about the process, how you read. Like, uh, do you pick, how do you pick a book? Uh, do you read before going off to sleep? Or do you read throughout the day in between gaps or uh, do you read multiple books on it like at the same time like simultaneously depending on like so that's what the question was really oh well i mean i'm um well first of all my reading has evolved obviously as my life and career have evolved um and i have to say that um that's true probably of everybody i read massively as a kid i also grew up in india where there were very few distractions available and therefore, I was much more, um, um, you know, books were my escape, books were my entertainment, books were my education. Um, they were the only uh, option available anyway, because there was, in the India in which I was growing up, no TV, no computers, no mobile phones, uh, no Nintendo, PlayStation, whatever. So I had, I had, I had books as my, as my principal source of entertainment. I read massively, indiscriminately. I've written about the year where I was foolish enough to set myself a goal of reading 365 books in the year. And I, and I actually completed the list before Christmas. I don't recommend that. I never did it again, but it can be done uh, in, in, in that kind of era. Um, obviously one reads much less since. Um, I continued reading through college and, and early working life until the kids came. And once kids were born, uh, they started taking up more of the time. And then also as I became more serious about my writing, uh, the time devoted to writing uh, came at the expense of possible time available for reading. So certainly the amount I read has gone down colossally. Um, and of course, I must admit that reading is something one does all the time, not just in books, but also on the internet. I must be reading hours a day, including of articles and, and sometimes fairly lengthy essays and other material on screens all the time. And that's something which... <clears throat> not just many of us do. And, and very often um, I also find myself reading books in the conventional sense um, on, on, on flights, on journeys, where you can actually be more assured that you will not be interrupted by the incoming email or WhatsApp or visitor or phone ringing. Uh, and then you can actually have a concentrated period of time on the flight to Tiruvan and Tukuram. Uh, if, you, if you get a non-stop one, it's about three and a half hours. If you get a one with, with one stop, then you're looking at four, four and a half hours on a plane. I get a lot of books read that way. So the, the short answer, Moitri, is read when you can. And that's, that's essentially what, uh, what I've been doing. And there is no real fixed pattern. I'd like to be able to say, because I wanted to say it, that I, I read last thing every day but it's not really always possible because last thing every day you might be replying to an urgent email, you might be meeting a friend, uh, you might be uh, even thanks to COVID and everything else watching a Netflix movie, you might not be reading a book the last thing. But it would be a very healthy habit, Moitri, if you want to try that because everyone says that um, not looking at a screen is 
the best, best way to gently encourage the melatonin production inside you so you can get some sleep. Uh, so do read Last Thing at Night, even if I haven't um, honestly been uh, a living exemplar of that approach. Thank you. Yes. yes, don't look at a screen unless you're reading Splainer. That's all I say. <laughs> well, I do that too every morning. Um, actually, Nivedita has a really interesting question who I think is really asked of you. Nivedita? Uh, hello, good evening, sir. I'm Nivedita. And, uh, Hi, I'm from Delhi. So I've watched a lot of your interviews over the years, uh, like one with Mr. Karan Thapar, with Hasan Minaj. And uh, so uh, while I initially I was going to ask who was your toughest interviewer ever, <laughs> aside from Mr. Karan Thapar, but then I thought this was more interesting. Uh, you worked for a number of years for the UN and then you also stood for the elections. Could you tell us one of your fondest memories of the UN? Oh, there are many. You know, I spent an awful long time there. It was just a month shy of 29 years. So I have, I have hundreds of, uh, of memories, but I had to pick one that would relate to a fairly early stage in my career when I was running the UN High Commissioner for Refugees Office in Singapore. Um, and we used to rescue and we used to have ships, commercially flying ships into the port of Singapore who rescued refugees fleeing Vietnam, the communist government there in tiny little boats getting picked up on the high seas and, and, and brought into the port. Now, there are many, many human interest stories, but I'll tell you one which stayed with me an awfully long time was about a young family um, that fled in a, in, a, in, a, in a tiny boat with a cannibalized tractor engine to power it. Uh, but the engine, of course, inevitably conked out uh, and the boat started drifting aimlessly in the South China Sea. They soon enough ran out of food. They ran out of drinking water and, and they were essentially living on rainwater and hope uh, while they were drifting. But they had two small kids, a toddler and a baby. It was a young couple. And obviously the baby and toddler were not going to survive on rainwater and hope. So what the parents did, and this is human desperation and human ingenuity, they slit their own fingers and made the, the, the babies suck their blood in order to get some nutrients into the system. An absolutely horrific sort of thought. When, when they were rescued by, as it happens, an American ship, uh, they were so weak they couldn't even sit up and, and there were all sorts of dramas involved in physically rescuing them to bring them up into the ship. And when that ship arrived in port in Singapore, my staff and I had to break every rule in the book to get them into the ICU in hospital without all the immigration formalities because they might not have made it. And then to see that same family a few months later, healthy again, well-fed, well-rest, and heading off to embark for new, on, on new lives uh, in the United States as it happened. To me, that was such an extraordinary um, uh, satisfaction that human beings could organize themselves to make such a significant difference to the lives of, of, of strangers. And um, I was able to do that pretty much throughout my UN career and, and subsequently in Indian politics. And I've often found that the best justification for being, as it were, if you can make a difference to others, then uh, you know what you're doing by the space you're occupying and the air you're breathing and the food you're eating is worthwhile. That's, that's essentially been um, an insight from my very early days when, when this particular incident occurred, I was all of 25 or something and it, it stayed with me uh, throughout. And there've been very many other kinds of people I've been able to help in very many different circumstances. And those are the fondest memories, the memories of when uh, being able to use the, mm -hmm. uh, clout that I had as a representative of a world body made up of governments, the United Nations, in order to deliver results for real human beings, and very often human beings I could actually see and touch and, 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 and watch in person, not just figures on pieces of paper. That, to my mind, made, um, in many ways, life worth looking. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so, the next person is Sneha, and she has an interesting question. Uh -huh. Given what's happening with Amazon and Twitter and all of that. Sneha, you want to ask your question? Actually, I'm Sneha's husband. <laughs> I've been watching on the same screen. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Ajit. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's about, uh, you know, you're seeing all the uh, 
new, the you know competition uh, CCI have been putting rules against uh, Amazon and uh, big players. You're seeing a concentration of uh, business and wealth, especially in the infrastructure, to a few few players, and especially when you know you wouldn't. You know, you see the if you do the financial due diligence, you know they probably wouldn't qualify. So all these things are a concern. You know, the people people are losing out, and uh, where are we going with this? I mean, what's your what's your take, and how would you resolve the situation? So where are we going with what with with the um, with the concentration the, uh, of wealth? Yeah, in two few well, hands. I think, I, like, I think yeah, governments are waking up to this. Um, Sarah's husband, I didn't catch your name. Um, but but the truth is that Ajit, hi. Um, I would say that um, I would say that there is clearly a development along these lines, um, and we're seeing this um, particularly in the West and in India, um, and there's already also the beginnings of a backlash to it. We're seeing, for example, in China, Xi Jinping has actually very specifically decided that he does not want. Um, large companies to get too big for their boots. He's already attacked Jack Ma and Alibaba. You know that the famous disappearance of Jack Ma for a while and steps being taken to cut Alibaba down to size. He has talked about uh, trying to restore socialism and a greater equality in his country, uh, even though for the last generation or so, China has been a country where some have become incredibly rich. Uh, Putin, um, did cut some of his oligarchs down to size. He didn't cut down the oligarchs uh, who weren't challenging his authority, but the signs are that Russia may also be heading in that direction. Uh, in the Western countries, you've now seen the interesting discussion in the G7 of a um, minimal tax on multinational corporations. The realization that some companies were getting very rich and making some of their owners and shareholders very rich by essentially avoiding paying tax anywhere, by registering in a tax-free jurisdiction, conducting their operations elsewhere, making profits accordingly. And now they've talked about a minimum 15% tax on any multinational anywhere levied in the country where they're doing business. So all of these things, are, I think, are the incipient signs of a regulatory approach towards pretend, uh, preventing the um, concentration of business and profit in very few hands. Um, in India, we're seeing uh, a similar phenomenon, as we all know. I mean, the Congress party uh, keeps attacking the government uh, for its crony capitalism and favors to a few close allies. But you could also look at it the other way and see the way in which the government has, for example, passed re a regulation that has made it difficult for Amazon, uh, Walmart, et cetera, uh, to dominate or, or essentially um, uh, take over our e-commerce market in India. Um, now, the result may be that some Indian players who are the Indian equivalents uh, will be the fat cats who take over. So it may not be much of a victory for you, Ajit, but I'm just saying that there is a consciousness amongst policymakers everywhere that um, regulations have to be applied to prevent a handful of players from becoming all powerful and, of course, omni rich. But Shashi, like, but I think the question he's asking is that, yes. But what does Atmanirbhar mean? But does Atmanirbhar mean that, is it back to the old days of crony capitalism where a couple of Indian players, just because they happen to be Indian, get all the benefits? And is that really sort of fantastic for the country particularly? Or is it just particularly fantastic for a couple of people who, who happen to hold Indian passports? Very good question. And in fact, this has been the concern for many of us. Um, what does Atmanirbhar mean indeed? I mean, in the, in the days of self-reliance, which was denounced in the 90s as a failed policy, we essentially prevented uh, foreigners coming into our market and tried to do everything ourselves and contented ourselves with shoddy overpriced goods. And we all know the story. Now, are we going to return to that era? Or are we going to say that Atmanirbhar simply means that we will develop indigenous capacities to be able to compete with, with big players around the world the way the Chinese did. The Chinese do not have a closed market, but they've made things very difficult, it seems to me, for um, um, others to compete with Chinese companies um, on, 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 in a number of sectors, uh, while at the same time, China has remained thoroughly engaged 
of global trade, global markets, and, and, and global um, sales. Now, at the moment, Atmanirbhartha, frankly, is little more than a slogan. It came up last year. Um, thanks to the pandemic, there hasn't been a lot of significant developments in the Indian economy. So who knows whether we can actually come to any conclusions about what it's going to be in practice. But the fear your question expressed is a real fear. It's one that many of us share. And we would have to see in practice how the government actually performs, what kind of policies and regulations and tax structures, what kind of protectionist measures will they try and keep out others from coming in. I think the Indian government um, may want to enable just a couple of their favorite friends, but will also be constrained by the fact that they're operating in an international environment where their policy choices are constrained by the friendships they're trying to establish and the goodwill they're trying to win in, for example, the Western world. So I wouldn't be in a quick rush to say that we're going right back to the pre-1991 era, but I would say that we need to keep a close eye on how Atmanir Bharta evolves in practice. So I'm going to actually ask Anita and JK to sort of ask their questions. They're sort of the same question in different iterations. And this is, <laughs> these are really political questions about, it's actually about the opposition. Like who is the opposition to the BJP government, to Mr. Modi? So Anita and JK, can you ask your questions? And then maybe, you know, uh, Shashi can give a common answer to both of you. So I can start. Uh, I mean, I, I, my question is really if you could just comment on the crisis of leadership in the Congress party. I mean, you may disagree there is a crisis of leadership, but that is the general impression from, from the outside. And I'm speaking here as a strong supporter of the Congress who has been increasingly disappointed, uh, you know, completely you know, really uh, like uh, frustrated and, uh, you know, I mean, just not having an alternative. I mean, I definitely am not pro BJP and, you know, and yet I have nothing else to hang on to. You know, now the ARP looks interesting, but, you know, they're not really a national party. So, but, uh, but then again, nor is the Congress. So, so I guess the question is, uh, what is, um, you know, is there no scope for a non-Gandhi to lead the party? Because we do need a non-Gandhi to lead it for, for it to have a future. That, that is something I do believe. Uh, so that's my question. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for being a supporter. We, we need the few we have. Uh, don't take up seriously. I live in Delhi. It's a party completely devoid of anything remotely approaching a political principle or conviction. And, and sadly, uh, because I, I had a number of friends who were attracted to it when it first came into being. Uh, it's, it's opportunism, cynicism, and frankly, lack of any decent conviction or principle have made it as reprehensible uh, to the eyes of many people of the sort of liberal sensibility you seem to, uh, seem to embody uh, as the BJP. So I would not, uh, I would not <laughs> want you to head in that direction. I think you should think of the Congress as a national party, despite your cutting remark in that regard, because the Congress is the only party other than the BJP that has a nationwide footprint and arguably a better footprint than the BJP because it is present. Uh, and, and even in the 52 seats it won, it won seats in Northwest and Southeast and Southwest and Northeast and North and South. It has a presence everywhere. And more important, there are 16 states out of the 29 in the country in which it's a straight fight between Congress and BJP. So you, 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 you really can't think of an opposition, a viable opposition in India without the Congress, because the Congress occupies this enormously large footprint, which frankly the opposition needs. So even if I would concede with you that in many parts of India, all we have is indeed a regional, credible regional opposition uh, to, the, to the BJP, um, I would say that a longer term evolution of a united opposition challenge to the government would be incomplete without the Congress because the Congress potentially occupies the largest space in it. As far as the leadership issue is concerned, as you know, I've been one of those who spoke out last year about the, the drift in the, in the party after the unexpected resignation of our party president, Rahul Gandhi. Uh, and, and I think if it were not for the COVID pandemic, that issue would have been resolved more directly through something like an AICC session. There was a promise made in the working committee meeting for that to be convened. 
and then that got deferred when the second wave came up. So I think that clearly clarity of leadership is indispensable. One possibility is that Rahul Gandhi simply return. You um, seem to seek something else, but I think you will accept that in the party, in any political party, it's the person whom the workers want who would end up leading uh, uh, and, and being sort of the mascot of the party. And I think there's very little doubt that the party workers would like a Gandhi and in particular Rahul Gandhi to take the lead. But I would remind you of a wonderful slogan from the 2014 election, um, which uh, I think we came up with too late and didn't use long enough because it really encapsulates the value of our style of leadership. And that's a slogan that we came up with towards the latter part of the 2014 election. And that was, uh, hum. that, you know, you've seen for seven years, a style of leadership that is all man, 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 the 56 in chest, the uh, forked beard now, <laughs> the, uh, the I have the answer to all the problems, I know what's best for you kind of leadership versus a leadership that says, I don't have all the answers, I want to listen to you, and I'll come to you with a whole group of experienced, capable people, the hum of our narrative, who will work together with me to deliver solutions to you. That's how the Congress has worked very effectively in the UPA governments that, as you know, the media is finding more and more virtues in by comparison with the horrors that have been visited upon us by the BJP experience. And I would say that if we can con communicate that more effectively in the next few years, uh, we will be able to persuade the Indian public that there is a good, viable alternative. I mean, frankly, uh, India needs that alternative because those of us of a more liberal bent than the present ruling party, those of us who are more interested in values like inclusivity, socially and, and, and otherwise, um, economically, uh, uh, those who are interested in freedom of expression, human rights issues, um, a much more tolerant, let live kind of approach to differences, whether it's cultural differences, political differences, sexual orientation, whatever all of these things may be, let them all be, this is the India we all cherish, uh, and who don't have this kind of chip on the shoulder, Hindu-Muslim bigotry as their animating narrative. For all these people, and I still believe they represent the majority of Indians, the Congress party still represents the best and most viable answer. And I, I hope to be able to, uh, I've been trying to articulate that answer in my writings and speeches and conversations, but I hope that we will, through uh, settling this leadership confusion or drift that you mentioned, I hope we will be able to give you all a genuine vehicle to, uh, to take uh, the idea of an inclusive India forward. That's what I am in politics for. Okay, I'm gonna push you a little bit, little bit on that, Shashi, like the me nahi hum, right? But we do not historically have any history. We have been in love with individuals, whether it's Panditji, whether it's Mrs. Gandhi, even whether it's you know, Rajiv Gandhi. We have always been led by one leader. Um, we do not have a history as a nation now. I don't know about culture because now that goes much, much, much more, you know, further. Um, do you think culturally then, is there an older answer that says that we are as a society can buy into a collective idea as opposed to a person? Look, I, I don't disagree with you. I've been for the longest time, for more than 25 years in writing, an advocate of a presidential system as being much more suited to the character of Indian people. We do tend to vote for individuals uh, rather than for parties, but we actually have a parliamentary system. That's what the constitution gives us. That's what we all swear allegiance to. And in the parliamentary system, you vote for parties and policies, and you vote for a whole bunch of individuals up and down the country. You don't actually vote for an individual. And on top of that, when you get to the point of a coalition government, which clearly is the alternative answer to a BJP government, then you're going to, in any case, have to have a number of, of, of leaders contributing. So whatever, whatever be the merits of the individual who may lead the coalition or serve as prime minister, you still will need to have a number of leaders working together. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that, um, you know, people like uh, Narasim Rao and Dr. Manmohan Singh have shown us that you don't have to be a larger than life chappan and chati kind of figure uh, to be able to bring about real and meaningful change in the lives of ordinary Indians. So uh, I, I'm still sticking to my guns on Menahi Hum, but, uh, but it's obviously a longer debate. 
JK, do you want to ask your question about the right word shift in the country? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lakshmi. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tharoor. Uh, it's a pleasure being able to ask this question to you from personally because I've only interviewed you as an ex-journalist in professional capacity and those have been very topical. But this is a question I really mean to ask you because I happen to be reading the book uh, that is also lying in, uh, behind you, uh, which is written by you. I think it's the latest book that you had just released. Uh, is it, uh, going by the principle of word, of word and window, do you feel like the only alternative is going to be difficult for any left of center or centrist party to be able to come to power for the next few elections? And that anybody who plans to uh, 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 take power away from the current disposition has to portray a right of center or a right character, a nationalist, religion, or, you know, in some cases, stories which even call certain moves made by Congress as a soft Hindutva uh, kind of a persona. Do you feel like for the next few decades, that's what we are looking at in the elections, that we are not going to be looking at a left liberal uh, or a left of center central government, maybe for the next 25, 30 years? Oh, thank you, JK. That's very interesting. I'm assuming everyone listening to knows what the Oberson window is. It's the range of policies politically acceptable to the mainstream population at any one time. Uh, the sort of window of, of discourse uh, that an American uh, policy analyst called uh, Joseph Oberson came up with, um, who says that any idea as political viability depends on whether it falls within a range of what's acceptable to the population. Now, if you are saying to me that what has happened is that the Overton window in India has shifted and that people uh, are willing to accept uh, much more right-wing uh, or culturally nationalist uh, ideas that the BJP has been pushing than they used to be, the answer is absolutely correct. And certainly if you look at Northern India, um, uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely clear that uh, the Hindu Rashtra vision of India which was a two to 3% of the public idea through the 50s and 60s, um, and which won only two seats in parliament in 1980, uh, in 84, I beg your pardon, two seats. But that has now become across Northern India, uh, a mainstream and even uh, a potentially a majority winning uh, view of Indian history, culture, and, and India's place in the world. But I would hasten to remind you that even while acknowledging that, that the discourse has gone that way, that the BJP won 31% of the vote in 2014 and 37% of the vote in 2019. And that you're still looking at 63% of the voters in our country who have not subscribed to the BJP or culturally right view of the world, of, of, of India, of our history, of our relations with people of other faiths, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things are contested. Uh, my argument is if you stop thinking of it purely in terms of your open window, but ask the question whether some of the basic ideas that the, if you like, the Congress party or the non-BJP parties have stood for uh, still appeal to most people, you know, living together with and getting along with others, even if they're different from you. Um, some welfare projects from the government uh, that essentially assure you a social safety net, even if you don't have um, the kind of you know, Western welfare state systems, at least you have a ration uh, that's available, a public distribution system, you have some unemployment, you have the Manrega scheme, all of these things that were given to you by left and Congress governments. Um, and if you ask yourself whether the notion of inclusivity, uh, economic, social, cultural inclusivity appeals to people, I would tell you, that those are all still very much within the scope of, of the Overton window in India today. And I would even go farther and say that some of the BJP's biggest successes have actually not been in its divisive ideology of bigotry, but have been in the welfare clothes they have stolen from the BJP, from the, from the, from the Congress and the UPA. It's their delivering on, on building toilets in the villages, even if they don't have enough running water, and they're giving gas cylinders, even if most people can only afford to use them on special occasions. It's, it's one of these, prank, the, 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 the Udwala scheme and electricity, and all of these things, all of which, of course, the UPA was beginning to do. They, by emphasizing the last mile delivery, the BJP has actually, um, if you like, adopted the classic left liberal approach of providing welfare to the ordinary 
Aam Aadmi in India. And that doesn't suggest a totally uh, right-wing politics, as was expected when Mr. Modi in 2014 campaigned against poverty,arianism campaigned against Manrega, said the government has no business to be in business, etc. He talked a very right-wing economic approach, but he has implemented a completely welfare uh, Congress UPA style approach uh, in government. So I don't think that it, as long as your conversation is, is this ideological one about uh, uh, overs and windows and so on, I don't really think that the debate is over yet. And if anything, I would argue that um, we are very much heading um, uh, in the direction where it looks like it's the policies that UPA enshrined as the policies that mainstream India wants that are actually going to be implemented um, by the BJP in order to demand votes and people in return for these policies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thirur. I Hopefully India will resist any temptation for a single party system like the CCP. But thank you very much for your answer. I, I certainly will be working to ensure that. Thank you. So we're sort of, you know, getting towards the end uh, because we've taken more than an hour of you. So I'm going to leave it to Morley because I think he has a question that is sort of a little different from everything else. Uh, it's about foreign policy. Morley, you want to ask that? Yeah, thank you, Lakshmi. And uh, thank you, Dr. Taro, for doing this. Um, and a hello from a fellow member of the Fletcher Mafia. Oh, good. Good to see you. I mean, there were not too many Indians at Fletcher in my time, so I'm glad to discover another one. Thank you. So uh, I would like to pick your brains on some foreign policy related aspects. So what are your thoughts on the great power rivalry? And I read Dr. Uh, Jay Shankar's book where he speaks about um, multipolarity. Is that NAM in uh, you know, a different shape? Like is it old wine in a new bottle? And hypothetically speaking, I mean like if you were the EAM, the External Affairs Minister, uh, what would be your top three priorities? And where would China figure in all of this? Thank you. China would have to figure in any Indian foreign minister's top three priorities. And I would say that um, number one would be the neighborhood because the immediate neighbors uh, are always the... Um, the, the Can I the, explain the what they have? I'm sorry? It is affecting a sex life. What? That was an interesting... Maybe that's a bit of trolling. Uh, is, is Splainer affecting my sex life? I don't know the answer to that because I have to admit that Splainer hasn't quite got into my into my life, it's only been on my screen so far, but we'll ask Lakshmi to explain what that question is supposed to mean. But coming back to, to so first priority is the neighborhood. And by the neighborhood, I mean, of course, every country abutting us that we have a border with, including Pakistan and China. Um, on the question of, um, of multipolarity, uh, when I was briefly in the foreign ministry, I tried to articulate the heretical notion of multi-alignment. It sort of sank like a lead balloon in those days, uh, but I think it's coming back into vogue. And my argument in a nutshell was that um, non-alignment made sense in a binary world, but that the world has moved from that binary division of the Cold War, Cold War and from the unipolar dominance of the US in the 90s to a worldwide web kind of world where everyone is networked and where you would have relations uh, with some countries just uh, as you have on the internet that... Uh, you would have relations with some countries for some purposes, be connected to other countries uh, for other purposes. These two countries may be connected to each other and may not be, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, you would have different networks of operation and influence. Uh, and, and to give you, to illustrate it, I would say, for example, that, that we would be involved uh, with the Russians and the Chinese in RIC, when the foreign ministers have an annual meeting with their counterparts in Russia and China. Then we'd add the Brazilians and the South Africans for, for BRICS, where you'd have this entire uh, uh, new sort of alternative level of cooperation on global issues. Then you'd actually kick out um, the Russians and the Chinese and just have the Brazilians and the South Africans for IPSA, for Southern Hemisphere cooperation. And then you'd add the Chinese, but not the Russians for basic for environmental negotiations. And India would be the one common element in all of these different networks or these different alignments and not merely because our name conveniently begins with that indispensable uh, element in every acronym, a vowel. So we are the only vowel in BRICS and RIC and IBSA and so on and so forth. But my point is that it's because we have something to contribute each of these networks and something to gain from each of these networks. Similarly, we're living in a world where on the one hand, we want to be um, a voice of the developing countries of the UN, the, the G77, uh, and at the same time, we want to be part of the world's 
management, uh, macroeconomic management through the G20. Uh, we want to be uh, an important voice for the post-colonial countries in the non-line movement, while at the same time, we want to work alongside the democracies and the community of democracies. Um, we want to um, seek a permanent seat in the UN uh, as, as, a, as a country that believes it has a global role to play. And at the same time, we want to have a strong South Asian presence because we know we can't do without our neighbors. Our neighbors are the countries that can actually impede our growth as well as uh, in many ways be uh, the best enablers of it. And as long as we follow a, a policy of asymmetrical benefit to our neighbors, we can create a very congenial neighborhood. So this vision is the vision with which I, I try to articulate multi-alignment. I think increasingly we are heading there. Of course, things have been very complicated by the, the messy relationship uh, that we've seen in recent years with China and uh, as a result, partly also with Pakistan. When I was articulating it 2009-10, um, we actually were an upswing with China. It's now very much on a, on a downswing. The Chinese have clearly decided to to uh, try and cut us down to size, keep us off balance on the border. Uh, and their colossal investment of $90 billion in Pakistan under their Belt and Road Initiative to create this amazing uh, expressway to Gwadar and then to develop Gwadar into a major uh, Gulf port uh, could be transformative and could also actually change equations between Pakistan and us and embolden Pakistan much more uh, because of the Chinese backing. So we're looking at a very significant change in our immediate external environment. And that may have driven us more closely into the arms um, of the Western powers through uh, entities like the quadrilateral dialogue, the Quad, where for the first time, we have even had a summit level contact between the Americans, Australians, uh, the Japanese and us, and, and potentially that could expand further to include one or two other countries. So there's a lot of things happening. These would be uh, the priorities of any Indian uh, uh, a ruler, while at the same, or any Indian government, any Indian foreign minister, while at the same time acknowledging that the way things are, um, you also have to have the quick wittedness to respond creatively to what's happening in the world that you can't predict. So these are the broad orientation. Within that, you have to have the ability to relate on a day to day basis with whatever's happening in the world. And I think that's something we really will have to uh, spend a lot of significant effort on in the years to come. And on the great power rivalry, Dr. Tharoor? Great power yeah. rivalry is now becoming a US-China rivalry, no doubt about that. Um, in fact, it was interesting that Putin uh, and Biden met, that Biden chose to meet Putin so early in his presidency because he, he was almost signaling to the, the Russians, I'm going to continue giving you the respect you deserve as a, you know, a superpower, as a superpower you used to be, uh, provided, of course, you don't completely put all your eggs in the Chinese basket because we have some concerns about China. And I think that's an interesting thing. Could you imagine a situation where um, the, the great rivalry is between the US and China and that a country like Russia, which so far seems to be very firmly in the Chinese camp, could be sufficiently neutralized in order to be a sort of uh, almost non-aligned power between the two. Difficult to say. At the moment, the Russians seem to see their interests very much in opposition or in contradistinction to that of uh, America, the Western democracies, and their sympathizers, and therefore much more friendly to China. And, and certainly in our neighborhood, if Russia starts warming up much more to Pakistan, they recently had military exercises in Pakistan, they're selling weapons to Pakistan. If we end up with Russia going over into a Russia-Pakistan-China axis, that will inevitably do us enormous, enormous damage because these are, from our point of view, land powers and uh, the Quad countries are essentially connected to us through the Indian Ocean. They're maritime powers. They're not powers uh, in this region with any significant ability to help us in a land conflict. I mean, if you have actually a Russia-Pakistan uh, attack on India with the Russians refusing to help India or supply arms to India or even being neutral, then you're looking at a very serious calamity because we may not be able to resist a two-front war without any meaningful, credible allies on the ground. So our diplomacy, and, and remember, all diplomacy has to be about the, not just the security, but also the well-being of the Indian people. It's not a, a, a game of just, you know, shuffling uh, tiles on a world map. 
it's it's about how do we ensure that the Indian people are safe and well and so on. We need to do our best to create an enabling environment where we can grow and prosper, where our people remain safe and secure, and when there is no great danger of this whole thing coming undone, us being at the receiving end of, of, a, of a war or, or, or of a, a calamitous one-sided military failure. And that's the, the real challenge uh, in the next few years. Um, I, um, I think that, that here the country has to be united. We are not interested in playing party politics, even if we are not very impressed with the way in which the BJP government has handled the whole China issue so far, and even the Pakistan issue so far. Uh, we are Indians first and, and have party politics second. I, I, I notoriously said once when I was chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament, I said there is no such thing as a Congress foreign policy or a BJP foreign policy. Uh, there is only Indian foreign policy and Indian national interests. And that fundamentally has to remain the case. So when I give you this analysis, it is not as, as a critic of the government, but as an Indian citizen who's as concerned about the future of my country as anybody serving in the government today. Thank you, Shashi. I think you've sort of taken more than your time, like getting to like one and a half hours. Thank you so much. You've been wonderful. And for like all the fantastic answers. Thank you all for the great questions. What great questions, and they're all of different kinds and very wide ranging. I thought that was a fantastic conversation. So thank you. Thank you, and my apologies. So I, I can see that the chat box is full of questions we never got to. My apologies to them, but, um, but one day, uh, God willing, we, we'll, have, uh, we'll have another opportunity. Yeah. But I do want to say once again, how much I admire Splina, the excellent work that you and your youthful team are doing. Um, it's readable, it's insightful, a lot of fun. Clearly you assembled a very impressive collection of members, subscribers, readers. So I, I really will be uh, happy to, to be part of this community uh, for a long time to come. Thank you again, Lakshmi, and all of you on this planar team. Thank you. Though we are not apparently very good with some, someone's sex life from what I can make out. <laughs> yes, I, I, I'm very curious as to who was interested in that question, but uh, <laughs> for the moment, uh, we, we, we should leave that and and, uh, and with all matters involving that subject, it's always better taken up offline. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Have a Thank good you. night. Bye. Take care. Thank you. All the best. Bye. 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 Bye.